Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today for his third Free Thoughts episode is Peter Van Dorn, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of Regulation Magazine. Today we're going to be talking about net neutrality and the history of regulations of a similar sort. But let's start by just introducing the topic. What is net neutrality and why do people seem, especially on the internet, very upset and riled up about it? If, if you talk to consumer advocates and some law professors, law professors without an engineering background, <laughs> they – perceive they, – they want the internet to be something called free and where every bit, right? So the, the internet for those who don't know is a packet-switched uh, telecommunication system and that is in contrast to the traditional telephone system which is where a, an actual line, a physical circuit – and is used by anyone who, who has a phone conversation, whereas internet communication occurs in what are called packets, which is a, a set of digital commands, at the beginning of which and in the end of which says, where is this command coming from, i.e., what, what computer? And every computer in the world has a unique what's called internet protocol IP address. And then after each command, digital command, is a, 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 an instruction of where – which computer this instruction is supposed to go to. But every um, component of a video or a conversation or a – anything done over the internet is broken down into millions and millions and millions of separate packets, each of which is a command – to do something, whatever that is, take this period and put it here or whatever and directions about where – in what to what machine is that packet directed. So it looks less like talking to you via two cups connected with a string and more Traditional like phone. sending mail. Well, it, it's – In ma- envelopes with addresses. No, well, it's mail where your letter is broken up into shreds. <laughs> and then it also goes to a, a, some sort of central carrier and then re – often and then put back out somewhere else, kind of like mail too. Well, every, every node in the internet is a computer and the computer takes each packet and sends it where the address says it's supposed to go to. At the final destination, the packets are reassembled by software – and hardware back into whatever it is that's supposed to be. It could be an email. It could be a video, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at its heart, <clears throat> net neutrality, at least in the legal non-engineering community, is a concept in which the internet is supposed to treat every packet the same. Not give any preference there's no speed pr- or like there's, bandwidth or Right. Anything. There's just a packet is a packet is a packet. So and a packet from a conspiracy website is treated the same as something from Facebook or Wikipedia or something like that. And it's to be tr- – so it's, a, it's this very anti-discrimination, equality before the law kind of concept transferred to <clears throat> an industry whose engineering is not understood by the lawyers who actually make these kind of intellectual pronouncements. Beneath that – is a um, uh, from a consumer point of view, most consumers don't care about this kind of equality before the law concept, but they care about and got, have gotten used to fixed monthly prices that don't vary. And this is just an accident of history, and in which um, the in the late nineties we put so much fiber into the ground, fiber optic cable that we had beyond a glut. We, we had so much dark fiber out there. The streets of, of – remember Washington was mm-hmm. ripped up and fiber was put down the middle of every street in every city, everywhere in the United States and much of the world. 
Therefore, the marginal cost of giving away stuff there was zero. So there was no point to charge. There was no traffic pricing. Yeah. yeah, there was no congestion. There was no nothing. So, so you just paid your thirty dollars a month for your internet service provider, and, and even if you used a ton of internet versus you went to one site once a day, that's the same price. So we now have a cultural problem, which is a set of economic conditions that is not sustainable. Is has uh, consumers have gotten used to that, and so consumer advocates see. Differential pricing, particularly for video, so, so-called bandwidth hogging content, uh, cons- consumer advocates often see that as a violation of something called net neutrality. Is is that the concern? I mean, because what you're what you're saying is we have gotten used to paying a fixed amount per month for effectively however much Unlimited. bandwidth as we happen to use um, coming from whatever services we're using. Uh, but I, when I see net neutrality debates, the, the concern is not so much that, say, Verizon is going to start charging people who use more bandwidth more a month, that there's going to be you know, overage fees, but that they're going to slow down or speed up certain traffic based on the provider's ability to pay, not the consumers. So Facebook might be able to pay more so that it's going to come across the lines to me faster than Twitter would, no matter how much bandwidth I happen to be using. So first two concepts I got to, you're the good student who has gotten to (laughs) concepts three and four that are part of some people's objections to uh, the internet and then they think net neutrality would solve these perceived problems. The third is vertical integration between content providers and the pipes. And this is a – I think it's a series of tubes is what you're looking for. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> in, in other words, the, uh, the Comcast-NBC merger has concerned many, many people by – with the worry that if you're a Comcast internet subscriber – that your ability to see NBC programs would be enhanced and your ability to see uh, anything else would be degraded without your consent or knowledge and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it and you'd be mad as hell and screaming out a window. And you might not have many options other than Comcast in your local area, so you're kind of beholden to them. Consumer advocates worry about the monopoly access to the household, the, the last mile of pipe. And um, most economists and engineers are less worried about that thing because they see competition um, in the sense of satellite providers and DSL lines that they think of as adequate and uh, many consumer advocates do not see those things as that amount of access as enough competition um, to prevent the mischief of – from vertical integration. So this seems to be a product, product of, as you said – putting down a ton of fiber, having inter- a proto-internet being not as much database, not having things like Netflix or people like that who can take up – or YouTube who can take up huge amounts of the bandwidth and then – and then so the expectations of that and then deals that were starting to be made by companies to prefer a certain thing and people saying, no, it had to be back to the level playing field that it was in 1995 type of attitude. That brings me to point number four, which is um, – Economists have a term for uh, um, certain kinds of products and they, they're what, they involve what are called two-sided markets. So a newspaper, the classic old-style delivery of content vehicle is a two-sided market in the sense that it gets revenues from consumers and it gets revenues from advertisers. And the newspaper has to decide, given its fixed and marginal costs, how much of those costs is it trying to recover from somebody called consumers and how much of the cost is it going to recover from something called advertisers? Jump forward to the internet, the internet, the back, right, the, the pipes, the people who own the fiber optic system, um, both what's called the backbone, which is the main links around the country as well as the last uh, connections to households. Those providers also are in, are in what are call, called two-sided markets in that they have – they deliver 
something called content from content providers, Netflix or your or my email, to recipients called consumers. And the um, internet firms can charge more to content providers, less to content providers, more to consumers, less to consumers. And they have to decide what maximizes profits and revenue from their point of view. And usually, as with newspapers, right, newspapers have always not been very expensive for consumers. I mean, we do, if, if the New York Times did not, if we saw the New York Times budget every year and then we divided about a million people at well now it's less it's eight hundred thousand and some odd people get the New York Times each day. Take the New York Times annual budget, divide it by eight hundred thousand and by three sixty five, <clears throat> and you'd get a rather high number. And you'd have a newspaper no one would buy, or maybe just <laughs> well ten dollar a newspaper or something like that. It, oh, I'd bet you higher. I mean, I, I mean, peop, <clears throat> advertisers pay a hundred and forty, a hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a one day ad. That's a page in the New York Times. I don't pay $150,000 to get the New York Times every day. So Netflix is paying its internet, prov its internet provider to do all sorts of things to make sure that the content, the video that people see uh, on their home computer screens is not bumpy, blurry, Getting video to work in a packet switch system is much more difficult than getting email to work because the video can arrive at different times, whereas the email actually can. And by times, I mean nanoseconds, right? The, the rate at which these packets are, are sent by light along the network is the speed of light. So you can do a lot per second. <laughs> but reassembling all the packets into a picture of a movie, so that's – Half the country can watch all this at the same time and it all works. Turns out that's, com that's more difficult than email. So Netflix is paying um, internet providers to do all sorts of things that I won't describe in an engineering sense to kind of enhance the probability that when you see the video at home, it actually will work from your point of view. And the question is sort of whether or not that's fair. In some to the consumers in some way, I'm a consumer and I like eight dollars and whatever it is a month that the Netflix charge for for online viewing on top of the usual standard old DVD business model. That additional charge, if I had to pay for all the things that get that get it right, that Netflix is paying, it would be a lot more than eight whatever it is a month. So. <clears throat> Same thing with Visa and MasterCard. How much of the charge is on consumers and how much of the charge is on merchants? And Visa and MasterCard have concluded that since currency is a free alternative, you can't charge consumers for using plastic. And But this got merchants mad. They don't like all the costs being on them and they've gone to Congress and they've gotten um, – political relief from some of those charges. And we're seeing an equivalent kind of struggle in effect um, in the internet. But again, the concern isn't just <clears throat> about fairness or costs to consumers, about you know, our internet bills going up to compensate for the bandwidth that Netflix or YouTube uses. It's about innovation and innovation on – based on kind of the unique characteristics of the internet. Because one of the things that has made the internet such a vibrant place for innovation is the phenomenally low costs of entry as a new business. Software is cheap. Web hosting is cheap. Uh, programming has become – it's still not easy and still is time consuming. But the tools for developing websites and web services have gotten much, much better. So it's much easier to build things. And so a Mark Zuckerberg in his dorm room can create Facebook with effectively no capital. But if suddenly in order to enter this market, he not only has to be able to build Facebook in his dorm room, but he has to be able to pony up costs to Comcast and Verizon and Time Warner and all of these people in order to make Facebook fast enough, then that is going to create enormous barriers to entry for new firms and all of these – I mean all these amazing internet services that we have started off. A huge number of them started off as Zuckerberg in his 
dorm room as opposed to large corporations who have the money starting a new product. So we might cut off the vibrancy of the internet. You have stated the concern of internet neutrality advocates very well. That, that, that's exactly what they state. What they miss is that um, they, in effect, economists would answer that the question is you're, you're now posing a problem where there appear to be gains to trade between something called innovators and something called venture capitalists, right? If, if the – well, two questions. One is how well can the market work to put very young, talented people with no money in touch with older people with lots of money so that this innovation can be funded? Question, that's question one. Question two, are there real cost differences between different ways of using the internet so that some startups in effect would impose large costs on the internet if those costs were just averaged out and so everyone's bill that's a fixed price per month would have to raise a smidgen in order to let this startup work versus the – another economic conception of the way to fund these things is that the startup, because of its use of the internet, is actually in an engineering sense complicated and imposing real costs on the internet and thus the charges for that imposition should fall on them and then we're back to that's in effect the right way to price. So entry barriers will increase but they're not made up. It's real. It's not like the internet provider is ripping off the new young entrant. Instead, we, we shift from the internet charges should be the way they are and they should fall on content providers that impose costs on the internet. But we now then go to this, the, the first question I raised, which is given those real costs, how well will capital markets in effect fund these innovations? And if that works out, then there is no entry barrier in the way you describe because the, the capital markets will fund these things given that um, they are – they will really add value. What if the ISPs um, are behaving less neutrally? So sure, they, they could say like, look, if you're using a ton of bandwidth or your, your startup is doing the kinds of things that cause congestion, you should pay more. OK. But what if it's instead NBC and Comcast and NBC has its streaming video service and it would certainly prefer that people are using that and so it goes and just slows down Netflix a little bit to the point where all the people who are on Comcast get frustrated and are like, yeah, I didn't like NBC's as much. It doesn't have as good a selection but at least it plays. Then – then it doesn't we're – not, we're not talking about things like you should pay for your usage. We're talking about ISPs being selective about whose services get through based on their own interests. The economist – well, the, you have phrased the concern of, of net neutrality advocates again very well. Congratulations. <laughs> um, the two, – two responses. One is none of the three of us – in this room are engineers and so some, so I will not state the engineering possibility or impossibility of doing what um, you allege. Some of the articles I've read by those trained in computer science say this kind of differential packet handling, i.e. we we know Netflix's packets and we know our packets and we can slow theirs down and speed ours up and blah, blah, blah. I have read some things that say that is engineering impossible, that, that, that the internet is not capable of doing that at this – but I won't, I won't overstate that because I'm not enough of an engineer to know whether the things I've read are valid or not. Two, I'll, I'll give an economic kind of intuition and then go to a completely different example and, and talk about it. Um, Sears, we, 
at least my generation. I'm I'm old, but but Sears is where I go to buy appliances and lawnmowers and washers and dryers. And I don't know if that's filtering down to young people or not. But basically, they don't have washers and dryers. Okay, and appliances. But I was very proud to to become an adult and then get a house and then go to Sears and buy the stuff for the house. And I said, Wow, I have I have I've arrived. An, I've, I've 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 made it. And th- that may seem archaic, but uh, anyway. So Sears uh, owns and and the Kenmore brand, right? It, it's it, its own version, right? You see where I'm headed here, which is: Does Sears have incentive to not sell or block the sale of Maytag and Westinghouse and all the other things that make appliances? The answer, if you've gone to Sears, you know the answer is no. They sell everything. They make their own brand, but they know other people sell brands and they know that if they were to cut themselves off from selling other things that they don't have an interest in, they'd make less money. So internet provides – so the question is, is there enough internet competition – particularly the last mile, right, the the access to households, is having a duopoly or an oligopoly rather than a monopoly, i.e. there's Comcast and there's the satellites and there's DSL and there's Verizon now in many, many urban areas. So most most urban Americans have access to four providers. Is that sufficient competition so that the kind of mischief that you described, even if it were possible from an engineering standpoint, is just not worth it because they can make more money by giving whatever content people want, even if it's not the content they own. And that's an old story, the, this idea of is there enough competition to make the market uh, either efficient or – efficiently non-discriminatory or fair or something like that. That goes back to things that we've been talking – we've talked about before on Free Thoughts and things that we've, we've been talking about as a nation uh, for hundreds of years. I have this quote here that I think is relevant uh, to read from an article in Regulation, which we'll link in the show notes. It says, um, the 120-year-old statement, the paramount evil chargeable against the operation of the transportation system of the United States as now conducted is unjust discrimination between persons, places, commodities, or particular descriptions of traffic. The underlying purpose and aim of the proposed legislation, uh, which is the 1887 Act to Regulate Commerce, is the prevention of these discriminations. And it was, again, about the lack of competition facilitating that kind of discrimination, right? Americans have long been suspicious of transporters of things having any stake in and owning content, any things they ship. So the laws governing U.S. railroads have never allowed railroads to own autos, to own coal, to right? So the, the the big innovation in the world in, in the Industrial Revolution that really made so many things that we now take for granted possible was railroads. So railroads were seen as – and all this language is still in the laws and the, and the, that we – that elites use to describe these things, i.e. essential facility, right, is very big in the law, that kind of thing. So we could go to our roads. Uh, what would – this is always, an, I think, an interesting question for libertarians to think about, which is how would we think about vertical integration between General Motors? Let's say we had Libertopia and we had a private world and we had private roads. What would we think of GM owning roads? And would GM owning roads then not allow Chrysler cars? To be shipped on GM-owned roads, right? And in effect, this is the same. And the next question would be: Well, if there was sufficient competition for roads, but then you say, well, who competes for roads? Who competes for roads? So, so notice that um, in transportation and now the internet, these ancient, and they're not just U.S. By the way, in my research for this um, talk today, I read a book that described English and U.S. common law as having lots of concerns about these things and judgments about these things. Common carriers. That most of us are not aware of and think, 
many libertarians think all the evils in the in – that, that is something called deregulation has now changed the way the legal and or political system think about transportation and or the internet. And but there's all this concern before the Interstate Commerce Commission in 1887. I, I did uh, – I read that there were lots of common law cases about access and about price discrimination and about cost recovery and about obligations, which libertarians would find odd I think now. But it, the legal system we usually recommend for resolution of these kinds of concerns was from our current standpoint rather pro-regulatory in a common law sense about not just letting the railroad and or the uh, uh, stagecoach firm decide what they could do without any constraint. Yeah, and that's the common carrier provision in the classic sense which everyone kind of learns about in law school. Really judge invented to say your specific business now has different constraints than someone else's business who has the freedom to decide – discriminate against customers and discriminate on price. You as a railroad or various certain things are now no longer allowed to do that. In the actual – again, there's – economists have, have thought about what what is – What's the natural monopoly that leads to the market failure that results in too little competition? And many have argued that it is the right of way. It is the – it's in effect the continuous strip of land that is free to be used as a conveyance channel, be it for a canal or a road or a railroad or a fiber optic system, that the right of way um, is the – entry barrier and then given the right of way, do you want three or four parallel competitors in that right of way to get you to, to avoid your concerns about entry restrictions and things like that? And we could auction off, you know, how much would you bid for the right to run a railroad in this corridor? Now, we didn't do that. What we did is we gave away land to the railroads to subsidize their um, uh, initial uh, creation and operation so that we could settle the West. Again, economists have sort of concluded that we probably settled the West too soon. It, it, it was – there was too little population density to actually warrant the development of all these systems. Without a subsidy of some sort. And, this, and, and, and lots of railroad regulation was actually about subsidizing – not high density lines in the east, but rather, uh, in effect, very underutilized railroads, say east of Ohio, um, in, in the early days. We've been talking about common carrier regulation, but a lot of the talk about the internet, they people end up saying it should be treated as a public utility. Is public utility regulation? similar to common carrier? Does it apply more – better to the way that we think about the internet than common carrier? Public utility and common carrier regulation are – I mean common carrier comes out of a transportation tradition. Public utility is usually thought of as natural gas, electricity and water and one can – we have uh, in the United States a mixture of municipally owned – we used to have municipally owned gas systems. I don't know if there are any more. We certainly have municipally owned electric and water systems. But we also have private electric and water systems. And again, they were thought to be um, the word natural monopolies, i.e. if you have three or four or five of these firms operating in a similar geographic environment, the cost structure of these firms is such that given the demand for their output, um, everywhere in that output range, marginal and average costs are declining and thus firms have incentives to keep lowering prices below their current cost structure so that they could survive if there were no other firms around and that's the natural part of natural monopoly that the market could only support one firm doing these things in, in every, any given area. So they would set rates and stuff with a commission or something like that to, to guarantee a rate of return but not to charge too much. And so, in, so the political response to the perceived – and we can talk about what the data say about whether 
the the under when economists have studied public utilities, did they actually find these kinds of cost structures or not? But anyway, the the political system responded as if that were true, and then uh, limited entry gave franchises for the operation of electricity or gas or water in a given area, and in, in return for that monopoly franchise. You then were subject to rate regulation, so that you would not abuse that franchise and charge consumers too much. So that notion that the internet is an equivalent, it, it has a similar kind of economics, and that it ought to be、uh, rate regulated in that manner, does indeed underlie many、um, advocates for something called net neutrality, and in turn. There are economists who've written、uh, ma- many for me in regulation, trying to outline what the history of public utility regulation actually did in the United States in gas,、uh, electricity, water, telephones,、uh, well, see, and、yeah. railroads. So, and, what do we see with that? Do we see consumers helped out by the Interstate Commerce Commission and public utilities regulation and all these ills that we created these systems for? Were therefore mitigated, and everything was hunky-dory. Some consumer. What what we see in every system that we had was、um, entry barriers, plus a system of transfers within the regulated system from some producers and some consumers to other producers and other consumers, and that political balance was necessary to keep political support going for. The rate regulation in each of these.、Uh, so, for example, what do you mean by kind of transfer? For well,、example? I'll give you.、Yeah. So, in railroads,、um, in railroads, there were what are called.、Um, we had value of service pricing when railroads, freight railroads, were regulated, and that meant that prices for low value bulk commodities like a coal and grain and basically the stuff that. Farmers shipped from the boonies to the urban setting. The prices for shipping those things were low. The prices to ship higher valued, less elastic demand manufactured goods, where the shipping costs were a low percentage of their total costs. So think, think of shipping corn, and the percentage of that total cost. To the consumer, that transportation would be, then think of a car, and think of the price to the consumer. What percent of of that bill would be transportation costs? So basically, you tax the shipping of manufactured goods over short distances on railroads, and you redistribute the proceeds to keep the prices charged to farmers and to other bulk commodity long distance shippers. You keep that price low, and that it was in accord with the populist sentiments of the over rural represented U.S. Senate, and with、um, it, it prevented sort of populist uprisings because me- remember many of the there was more competition in urban areas in railroads than there was in rural areas, so the monopoly pricing ability in rural areas was higher. So the rate regulation kept the prices down. It overcharged、um, urban users and urban、uh, high-value-added shippers, and that was politically stable for almost a hundred years. Now, what undermined? And same thing in, in telecom. Telecom involved redistribution from urban phone users and businesses to rural. Telecom users in a similar fashion, and what undermines these systems is competition ar- coming out, and it wasn't competition in rail because that was regulated. It was trucks. When trucks arrived on the scene in the twenties, what、you、they switched st- over? Well, the high that y- you started to ship these high price urban things not by rail but by truck. Well, then Congress responded by regulating trucks. Right, you have to. You、Once、have to you, squeeze and make sure no one escapes to make sure, yeah, with competition and different behaviors. When there's a tax and transfer system embedded in a regulation, and there usually is, you in effect have to prevent tax arbitrage. 
just like we're talking now about corp- the corporate tax and tax evasion uh, from U.S. corporations, the history of transportation regulation was we first did railroads and then we needed to do trucks because trucks were in effect causing leakage. And then we had to do barges, water, the whole barge transportation system started to take stuff away from railroads and that would undermine the tax and transfer system. Same thing in telecom, right? We had a a breakout of microwave competition against the traditional AT&T landline system and the uh, courts ruled that um, the, the FCC did not have the authority to restrict MCI from competing for corporate business in a private microwave system. And that's just like trucks competing against railroads. So in effect, um, the – I hope – well, the articles and regulation that we've had basically goes through all the history of this, shows how complicated it got, particularly in telecom, to try to create open access to the monopoly part of the network and create open access, which is what the 96 Telecom Act tried to do. We don't even talk about the 96 Telecom Act now because even though it's still on the books, everyone agrees it's a mess and it failed and no one cares anymore. So someday we'll repeal it. But the internet may face the same kinds of things. Uh, Is this like a general almost regulatory law in some weird sense that you – it becomes more complex – as you proceed forward because in situations like this, you have one item of regulation that affects some people but then it changes the behavior of the people they're affecting. So then you got to add more and you add more and then you make start making micro distinctions and it becomes far more political and then the regulators have a ton of power and you get capture. I mean, it seems like it's sort of like a, a, a natural ramping up effect you'd expect from this and lo- as long as everyone doesn't stay on the straight and narrow and just keep using the regulated regu- regulated utility, regulated aspect and not going outside of it or trying to innovate around it because as soon as that happens, you can either complexify the regulations, think about Uber and taxis, right? Or you can take them away. <clears throat> Again, as I said earlier, I don't see something called regulation as distinct from something called taxation. And in fact, there are articles in the literature about how regulation is often a substitute for more transparent tax and transfer systems the relevant word being transparent, right? That in Peter's world, um, at least in class, I always say it's always better to have explicit tax and transfer. I mean, if we're going to do it, we might as well tell the voters, here's what we're doing. We are taking money from you folks to give it to these folks because we collectively have a normative view that that's an appropriate thing to do. And we then could have a discussion about it. We could then have what philosophies would or would not support that kind of tax and transfer system. Americans are very uncomfortable uh, having those kinds of discussions. Um, Most politicians realize they would not get enough support for those kinds of discussions. But Americans are also hypocritical about it in my view in that most people want stuff even though culturally they'll vote for people who claim to be against taxing and transferring. What they're really against is taxing and transferring to people they don't like. They they approve of transfers to people they think are morally appropriate given whatever their views are. So in the United States, we don't have an explicit large state. We have an implicit large state. And it's – all of this runs through – much of it used to, the regulatory system. In, but we have deregulated largely transportation and energy and uh, telecommunications. But now all the old concerns are arising again in the internet. And so t- to people like me in the quote you read from 100 and whatever years ago, to anyone with any historical knowledge, this is deja vu all over again. We are – we are confronting issues about philosophy and taxing and transferring um, and we are not very good at that and we seem uncomfortable with it. And I'm worried – I hope we don't uh, but I'm worried that we'll end up with a obscure technic- – what appears to be a technical system 
for regulating internet access and things like that and pricing it. But in fact, it will be a very disguised and complicated tax and transfer system that will end up not working and unraveling and doing bizarre things in the way you described. Let's maybe expand on those fears a bit or articulate them further by taking these lessons that we've learned, these kind of laws of how or seeming laws of how regulations play out and see what would happen if if the net neutrality advocates got their way. So let's say that tomorrow the FCC or Congress or somebody passes, creates regulations that say ISPs can't charge content providers differently, can't treat traffic differently, that they have to be fully neutral. What sorts of things would we as consumers see happen? Well, the first thing you would see is that many things people value and think are really cheap would suddenly not work very well because all those in effect hidden um, payments by content providers that they now don't know exist. I mean the internet – the claim is that the internet has been neutral from its very beginning and now is just in the last few years being corrupted by vertical integration and or some mischief of the sorts that you've described. Um, but again, as what the, the stuff I've read said, it's really been not that way f almost from the very beginning. And so there's been much more complicated differential services supplied depending on what people needed. But again, in the two-sided market notion that economists have, people who have a large stake in content know all this because they – in effect, have been paying to get it delivered in ways that made the consumers think of it as just as easy as email. But in fact, from the internet's point of view, it was not. But consumers still just pay their whatever a month and turn the thing on and it just works. So in a um, regulated environment where those payments by content providers were no longer allowed, either – there would be content degradation on the video viewing side of the sort that, that uh, would immediately cause a consumer uprising or there would be arbitrage and innovation in ways that I probably can't predict so that somehow content providers wouldn't directly be doing paying but they somehow would pay somebody who would pay somebody who would pay somebody and somehow the lawyers would say that's legal. I mean it, 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 regulation is um, – a game between two disciplines. Um, I, I, I don't know if I've said it, but it, as someone who has studied and been trained in more than one discipline, what I see out there in the world is a world mostly of one discipline people and where they – whatever they learn in college or graduate school, they then inflict on the world, <laughs> not realizing that it might be completely different than what some other discipline would do given its perspective. And the way lawyers are trained and the way economists are trained in effect play out in the regulatory environment. And the fight over whether regulation is mostly something governed by and overseen by people trained in economics or whether it is governed by and, and, and uh, overseen by people trained in law, I see it every day as part of the problem that, that in effect the law – with its use of words to specify whether you have or have not complied. And economists always see, well, I can draw an equation that says we'll call it this but it's really this and I'm going to fool you lawyers about all this. And it, 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 So it, at least the history of trying to control markets through regulation is basically this cat and mouse game between something called the law and its attempt to create neutrality among things it doesn't know much about and then markets and economists who say, you want this word to look like that word? I'll do whatever you want to make that happen. Uh, if we see that – you mentioned the workarounds that have been – or I don't know the right word, the innovations in changing how the internet has functioned ever since the beginning. It seems that one of the effects of putting in a regulatory regime um, that sort of defined – one practice and a different practice and you can be in category A or you can be in category B and you can be in category C is that it would it would keep innovation down because you would be working within the categories you're allowed 
or possibly trying to work around it and then worried about regulation on that side. And then it would be a question of whether or not the regulation apparatus can keep pace with the innovation inherent in the market and that would seem to create a problem. Right. The good news is um, for those of our listeners who know this topic very well, they would be screaming now at their at their computer saying, he's not talking about the most famous and most important FCC decision regarding the internet, which is to treat the internet as not subject to tr- traditional telephone regulation. And that that has been so – that has allowed the internet to flourish. They made this decision in the 90s or something? It was a series of court decisions that basically said – well, it was an FCC decision and then a whole series of court decisions that ratified that against people who thought that was wrong that said something called computer enhanced services weren't traditional telephone. And therefore, the whole FCC apparatus of rate regulation and entry controls and all of that did not apply. Yeah, everything would have been crazy different. It, it was, crazy different. Yeah. And, and it, if, anyway, I could, there's a whole long history of all those decisions um, and uh, again in the articles and regulation, they're, they're rehashed how we – sometimes the court I've, – I've done in some of my previous um, lectures with you, we've talked or discussions with you, we've talked about Supreme Court decisions that have made the world totally bad. One of them involved natural gas regulation. But on the computer, the, the decision to keep something called the traditional copper wire network regulated and then allow computer services to be unregulated and that was just a reading of what the law would or would not allow according to the courts. That's we, – we were really lucky in that because that basically allowed the system we now have to um, exist and what some law professors have actually argued for and are now arguing in, in their net neutrality debate is really to change the way courts decided some 20 years ago on these enhanced services decisions and to revisit those and then change those decisions so that – the internet is now under, from a legal standpoint, FCC traditional telephone jurisdiction. And then I, as you've asked me what would happen and I've speculated but boy, no. What's interesting is it, it appears that no regulators and no one in the – just people in law school some, seem to want this to happen but I, I can't find anyone else who does. How do we see most of the businesses themselves? Uh, that's an interesting, I think, question too. Pre-regulation, I mean, some of the fears that we may have and lessons we can learn from the past. Before regulation, biz- existing businesses living in an unregulated world may resist it or may not want it or may think it's a bad idea. After regulation, they may retool their entire business model around the existence of the regulation and then they probably wouldn't be in favor of deregulation like we saw in the 70s, for example, the airlines and the Teamsters and the truckers and everyone who were existing under a regulated model were not in favor of open competition. They wanted that kind of monopoly grant from regulation and that's an important point here I think, right? Regulation to try and fix monopoly problems can create monopoly problems. Right. I mean and again, uh, Mad Men, right, the show has made everyone have a view backwards of what riding an airline was circa 1960 whatever. Well, it was pleasant. It was – people were beautiful. Everyone was affluent. Uh, uh, the flight attendants were charming and the food was good and what happened with deregulation is airlines have become greyhound buses and it's, um, it's not – Americans say it's unpleasant and they wish they could go back to what it – but it looks like they're not willing to pay for it. Yeah, because they can if they're paying for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're, they're airline. I mean there have been a number of startup airlines that tried uh, all business class service to Europe was one and I – that seemed – and I looked at the price and I said, yeah, OK. I think by the time – I've never got it, – it's bankrupt. So I mean – I was pe- reading yesterday <laughs> people are a piece cheap. about uh, – I think it's Singapore Airlines has a suite class that's – $23,000. Yeah, $23,000 <laughs> and you have your own room and it looked pretty nice but – Some of the high Emirates and Singapore are are – Toying with the business model in which uh, plutocrats basically pay a lot and fly long distances uh, on there, but they're competing with, in effect, private and charters, right? And so that it, 
Um, what do we, we – but, um, but you're right. I mean basically I, I don't need to answer your question because it was actually an answer. Yeah. But, uh, well, what do we I, fear I, in terms of, of – I'll like, give you to, a re- quote. To sort of like recapitulate here. Like, what do we fear? What happened with regulated entities in terms of consumer service, price, innovation, and ha- and you know how do we fear that net neutrality could do that? Well, again, the, uh, for uh, the list of articles you will uh, uh, list to accompany this discussion, people need to read those because they are a relentless history of how complicated telecom regulation was, even for traditional telephones, which were a less differentiated service than and than the internet. In other words, it, a phone call was a phone call was a phone call and phone call quality didn't vary much across a business use versus a, a, a residential use. They were it's, packets going at light speed. There right. were millions of packets going at light speed. But, to rate regulate an environment where quality of the outcome varies by the kind of thing the pipes are being used for, that's a, reg- that's a regulatory nightmare and impossibility because once you set rates, then the way firms will respond is the high cost services that you're not allowing cost recovery for, even though you don't understand that, they will degrade the quality so that in equilibrium, they still make money, right? We, there are many dem- – if there's one dimension of service and it doesn't vary and it's simple, you can regulate and you can have rates that are equal for everybody and not a whole lot of mischief occurs. But once quality of service varies across end users in ways that content providers understand but the end users don't, then something called one price for everybody, which sounds good to m- many Americans, will cause an absolute disaster, only they don't understand it. But that won't be – I mean once that happened, then again, there would be some mechanism that people, firms, content providers would use to kind of regulatory arbitrage around this thing because it, it would interfere so much that people would rebel. One of the articles by Gerald Fallhauber um, in, in, in the – the bunch of regulation articles that deal with this. He was the chief economist for the FCC and then after that, he's been teaching law and economics at at Penn for – since then. He has a great article in which he said, OK, let's say it comes down to the question you asked. Then he said, I would recommend if there really is a natural monopoly and if there really is competition difficulties of the sort we've described today and some vertical integration occurs and then some content provider who's vertically integrated tries to not let the pipe sell the content of others that that are not owned by that firm. He said he would rather live with that than a rate-regulated environment because regulation preserves the status quo way beyond when it should and then innovation gets slowed and dulled and he said – a natural monopoly might be natural but there's technological change and markets change and so the mis- the bad stuff from the from the monopoly which many of the questions you asked are what we've been talking about today he feels in his gut that that wouldn't last very long whereas the mischief caused in a stagnant non-innovative rate regulated environment where the firms as you say got used to this environment like the protection, like the entry barriers, we'd really be suffering for that, from that from a much longer time, even though rates might not rise as fast or faster than inflation. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.